Right, good morning. Let's give this a go, okay? Um, so, you're all sitting there happily at home, um, and obviously we need to continue learning things. Um, so, for my group, some of this you will already have done. Because I'm uploading this where the other two groups can see it as well, um, I'm, I'm starting from kind of the start here as well. Um, so for my group, some of this will be a kind of recall, um, and for the other two groups, just kind of go from the very beginning, okay? Um, so what we want to look at, um, we need to consider you're working towards this comparative coursework. You need to be making points where all the different assessment objectives are kind of covered. OK, so you're, you're trying to make an essay where you're hitting AO1, AO2, AO3, all within the same kind of essay points. So in terms of context, the context will kind of underlie this. That will be AO3 in a minute. Um, I want to make sure that you're kind of doing some research around the kind of key question areas that are going to help you kind of facilitate your, your context that's going to come into the essay. Um, we're going to look at the introduction. That's the bit that I know my group have done in the very start bit with the headmaster. But we want to look at the introduction to the, the History Boys simply because it kind of sets up um, the intentions of um, Alan Bennett. And then we're focusing on the headmaster, but I'm going to try and tie in all five of the different assessment objectives with the exception of the comparison, which obviously is a bit harder to do because you haven't started looking at the Prime Minister Jim Brody yet, but I might mention it as, as kind of part of it, okay? So remember, in the simplest terms, when you are coming up with these points, you want to incorporate terminology within the points, you want to have a line of argument that runs through them, you want to have evidence, ideally probably looking at kind of three or four bits of evidence to each point, if not a bit more. It needs to have kind of context that underlies it where it's relevant to the question. Between points, there needs to be comparison to Primus Jean Brody, and we need to incorporate those different interpretations as we kind of go through as well, okay? So with that in mind, um, the first thing that I'd like you to do, and obviously you'll need to kind of pause me while you do this, while you kind of find all the information, I would expect probably to do it properly. Um, you might even spend up to kind of an hour or more kind of researching around the context in relation to this. Um, but this will be important. It will feed into your essay responses um, and it will kind of give you a good understanding about exactly what they're doing in both the play and the novel, okay? So as a start kind of activity, you need to kind of consider that when you're looking at AO3 as an assessment objective, um, it talks around um, both the context in which a text is written and the context in which it is received as well, okay? So it's, it's not just one. Um, it's not just when it's written, it's also how it's received by you in 2020, how it would have been received when it came out. And with the History Boys, you've also got the added bit, the fact that he's bringing it out in 2004, but it's actually set back in the 1980s or a pseudo 1980s. There's some historical inaccuracy that goes on there. OK. So you need to consider kind of it's set in the 1980s. So what is changing at this point? And you need to kind of do some research around um, education. So what exactly is changing about education at this point in time? What is sort of Margaret Thatcher doing to it? Um, how is the national curriculum coming along? You are thinking about kind of teachers. You're kind of linking back into that kind of um, how they interact, so uh, whether they're viewed as abusive. So what kind of rules are there in relation to teachers at this point in time? Um, have we got kind of protections in place for children um, and for teachers? Um, what kind of behaviours can teachers get away with? You're also thinking in terms of gender and sexuality. So you should be kind of aware what's happening in the 1980s in re relation to that. Um, so what kind of laws have happened in the kind of 
preceding decades as well, not just the 1980s itself. So those living in the 1980s, what will they have experienced in the years running up to it? Um, and, you know, what kind of, again, Margaret Thatcher is bringing it in, in, return, in relation to kind of gender and sexuality. Sorry. Um, you want to do the same for kind of 2004. So you've got kind of a change here. You've got kind of differences coming in. This is when he's first performing the play. Um, so how's it developed by that point? You can't necessarily do research around it at this point in quite the same way, but you also need to consider, well, how you're responding to the play in 2020. Okay, so things that appear in the play, do you think you're more shocked by potentially than those original audiences or do you see them differently because of the ch time change? I mean, it's been 16 years. It's been the, the amount of time that most of you have been alive um, and a lot of things have changed over that time. OK, so first thing you need to pause me at this point. Um, and you need to spend some time doing some research around this in relation to those key question areas. So once again, it's kind of how education has changed, how the kind of teachers and their interactions have changed, things in relation to kind of abuse and in relation to gender and sexuality. OK. Pause myself. OK, so hopefully this is working again and there's a cap for you. Um, you should have found things like, um, well, in relation to um, education, that kind of commodification of the education system, um, the changes between the Labour and the Conservative governments, so the Conservative government of the 1980s to the kind of Labour government of 2004, and then think about how you consider education. Um, in relation to kind of the teachers as abusive, potentially looking at um, the ways in which um, teachers at different points in history have been kind of vetted in different ways. Um, and as you go into kind of gender and sexuality, you want to think, well, homosexuality has only just become uh, legal. There are still a number of barriers. Um, so you, you are getting these kind of contextual issues going into this. Hopefully you've got a lot more than that, um, but that's our kind of starting point. OK. Right. OK. So before we go in and we're looking at the headmaster particularly, I think it, it's important to kind of consider the play's opening. So before I kind of go through this again, just Pause me for a moment. I want you to just read literally from uh, Erwin is in a wheelchair on page three, just to um, back to school. OK, just so that the kind of points that I'm making kind of make sense. OK. OK, so hopefully you've had a chance to have, just have a quick read of that. Um, now, this is kind of important in many ways. Um, and there's a couple of key questions that you potentially will use. I would say it may be in an introductory section. Um, I think bits of the introduction are potentially also usable in relation to the abuse question, maybe definitely the education question. OK, um, but for all three questions, parts of it, you know, will help you contextualize an overall argument. So the first thing you want to think is, well, why have Irwin addressing a group of MPs? OK. Um, so obviously MPs are associated with Parliament, they're lawmakers, it's setting it within a political sphere before you ever get into the school system. OK, so this does suggest things around um, kind of Bennett's political intentions with the play. He's, he's got a point that he's trying to put across. Um, he's trying to tell us things through the play. Um, Irwin's arguing a quite controversial point of view. You want to be able to kind of pick this out. Um, and he's using the same methods that he later pushes with the students. So he's telling them um, to kind of argue. He's telling them to take the controversial point of view. Um, he's kind of challenging them around that. And they're arguing about kind of law and the abolition of a jury and by extension, the abolition of um, 
innocent until proven guilty, uh, which is kind of a central tenant of um, the justice system, essentially. And in order to do this, um, he's essentially arguing that you, you get a different type of freedom. Um, it's quite similar, I always find it, to um, kind of The Handmaid's Tale, where I can't remember if it's Aunt Lydia or Aunt Elizabeth says, sort of, um, we're giving you a different type of freedom, essentially. We're giving you freedom from rather than freedom to. Um, but he's, he's twisting that logic, okay? But again, you want a bit of evidence that you can pick out from this bit that it essentially allows you to discuss how Bennett's creating a parallel between education and politics. And again, that's important. He's showing us that these are two supposedly different worlds, but they're essentially working in the same way. Um, both of them rely on kind of convoluted argument, deliberate kind of baffling of people. Um, they rely on show rather than substance as well. They rely on the argument being interesting rather than the argument being factual and sensible. Um, you get Irwin's kind of breaking of the fourth wall. Again, you are going to want to be talking about kind of um, different um, dramatic techniques as part of this. Um, you won't just want to be looking at the language. So breaking the fourth wall is a dramatic technique. He's talking to the audience directly. It's not the same as soliloquy. He's not just explaining his own mindset or it's not a kind of device used to express his mindset. He's actually deliberately talking to them. Um, and he's basically showing that he's aware of what he's doing, that he's deliberately manipulating people and baffling people. Um, he says, an, an amused tolerance always comes over best, particularly on television. Paradox works well and mists up the windows. So it shows a self-awareness about his kind of actions that he is deliberately manipulating he's not doing this accidentally it's not incidental he knows he's doing it and again it calls into question the morality in a political sphere in the educational sphere that this is happening on a conscious level um i don't know why both come in at once um the last thing to kind of think of here um is yeah the morality that comes in and then finally that paradoxical statement at the end um the loss of liberty is the price we pray for, uh, pay for freedom even um and you want to be able to apply this essentially to the the play that follows it's a, a statement paradoxical as it is that that fits with um the play so if you think about it around the education in the play that follows, well, if you want to give Hector freedom to teach what he wants, you take away potentially some of the students' freedoms. If you take away Hector's freedoms, you give the students' freedoms in different ways. Um, if you, again, you, you take away Hector's freedom to do what he wants in terms of molesting the students, um, but then you're giving freedom back to the students in another way. And it's essentially showing that all the way through, you, you can't have freedom in every way. Somebody has to lose freedom in order for somebody else to gain freedom. There's sort of only so much freedom in the world almost. So that's the opening of the play in a very basic way, but I just want you to have a good annotate through it, see which bits you would pick out that kind of allow you to talk around these things that especially in an introduction, simply stating that Bennett has a political purpose is often very useful, that he's got a message he's trying to put through, um, can be very useful. Um, and then as you go through talking about the educational system, how it's dangerous, well, the immorality that comes through this section. Right, anyway, so we'll move on to the headmaster. I'll just set up the context, then I'll get you to read the first bit in relation to the headmaster, okay? Um, as with kind of many characters, there's sort of an overall intention with him. So certain kind of key questions you want to ask about the headmaster wherever you see him appearing in the text. So um, you want to start with, does Bennett shape him as a sympathetic character? 
he could be Bennett could in theory be a, a kind of a Tory he could really like the educational changes in which case he'd probably choose to make the headmaster quite sympathetic he doesn't um, and this kind of suggests to you Bennett's point of view but you then want to be able to talk about how he makes him unsympathetic so think about how the character is shaped are we supposed to like them or not um, and then which exact views are given to that character where do they fit in wider society whose views are they in the mouths of one of Bennett's constructions uh, and the other prejudices he holds again are what are they representative of in, in wider society um, and how are those views presented? So um, what kind of methods is Bennett using? What kind of language is he using? How is he putting that across to us? Um, and we kind of links back to that first one. How exactly, again, you're, you're not just saying Bennett doesn't like the headmaster. You need to be picking out techniques that are used to kind of mock and undermine the headmaster as a figure. Um, and especially around the headmaster, Bennett creates a real sense of irony. Um, he's deliberately kind of provoking that um, and kind of challenging us in relation to the headmaster's actions to kind of see how through his own background, his kind of desires are rendered ironic. I mean, he's he's gone to Hull um, and yet he's pushing for kind of all these top university places. So um, the first thing I would like you to look at, um, you want to go to the headmaster and Mrs. Lintop, which is right towards the start. It's on page eight and it runs on to page nine. It's just over a page and about a page and a half, I suppose. Um, and I want you to read over um, that bit. Um, and what I want you to think about to start with, um, the characterization overall, um, the interaction between the two, what does the headmaster want, what kind of things are you going to pick out. You also need to be thinking though about what kind of um, different techniques Bennett is doing for this, okay. You need to get in terminology, you need to pick out evidence within these points. So this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are other bits you could pick out, but you want to think, well, the incomplete sentences, interrogatives, metaphor, how is irony created at various points? What's the ordering within his utterances, within his phrases? What does that ordering tell us about his desires and his intentions? Where can we see things like modals, interruptions, imperatives and, and sort of important stage directions that you might pick out as well? OK, so. Have a look. I'm going to, I would say, just kind of pause me for five, ten minutes. Have a look at that initial exchange. See which bits you would kind of pick out. I will then do just pick out a couple of bits afterwards. I won't pick out everything, but just a couple of bits to kind of get you thinking. Um, and then we move on to the next one. OK. OK, so um, this always feels kind of a bit awkward because I'm kind of expecting to be able to question you. <laughs> Um, but I can't. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to give you absolutely everything here, but um, there are various bits that we can kind of pick out. Um, the overall thing in terms of the exchange, well, obviously the headmaster is the dominant character within it. You can see him controlling the discourse. Um, you can see him kind of leading it in terms of it. So you can pick out various bits in relation to that. And what he wants here is clearly the students to go to Oxford and Cambridge not for their own good but for the good of the reputation of the school for what it will provide the kind of the school with so you want to kind of see how he pushes that agenda um, and there's a real sense of prejudice within this that anything other than Oxford and Cambridge is looked down on so We've got the, the reference to kind of Bristol and York, which are other Russell Group universities. Um, so you're, you're kind of thinking the top 20, even top 10. Um, and yet they too are looked down upon here. Um, now, Bennett doesn't approve of this kind of prejudice, essentially. 
Um, Bentley himself goes to Cambridge, but he doesn't approve of this kind of educational prejudice. So he pushes um, this kind of, or he makes it kind of ironic even. So the headmaster himself, you consider his kind of discourse, these Oxbridge boys, your historians, any special plans? Very often he'll speak in incomplete sentences. He Bennett creates him as not a very articulate character. He's, you know, at certain points he he's witty almost, but he's not created as a kind of an attractive character. And where we laugh at him, we're laughing at him rather than with him generally. Um, so that kind of undermines him. Um, you want to kind of look down the bit that everybody remembers, but I'm thinking league tables, open scholarships, reports to the governors. I want them to do themselves justice. I want them to do you justice. And you want to kind of think about the construction of this. What comes first before anything else is the league tables. Then comes the kind of the open scholarships and the reports to the governors. Then it's the students, then it's the teachers. So that order of kind of precedence, what's most important is something you can talk about. Um, you can talk about the fact that essentially, um, you know, he's interrupted um, Mrs. Lintot with that. She's sort of the, the year before. Yes, yes, I know that, Dorothy. Um, so his control, is there's kind of a rudeness and abruptness around it. Um, and as you go through, um, there's this sense that they they know the system and they are manipulating the system to do it. So you get the kind of introduction to the, the set of metaphors towards the end of the section. The facts are serving suggestion and Mrs. Lintock kind of continues the metaphor, a sprig of parsley, you mean, or an umbrella in a cocktail, um, where... What they're looking to here is not the students simply know what they're talking about. It's all about presentation. It's all about those little things that look good on top. Um, and it's it's about this kind of the polish that goes with it, essentially, as he describes it. Um, so, again, you're thinking about your argument here and the fact that Students are being judged not on their knowledge, but on their ability to present that knowledge on the kind of, you know, the argument and the outer appearance. And you can kind of call into question, well, is that fair within the education system? OK, um, there are other bits you might pick out from this section. Um, it's kind of significant that final stage direction where the headmaster goes out. And it's Hector that comes in um, and you want to think about the headmaster in conflict with different educational styles as he goes through. So the headmaster leaving Hector coming in is about placing that context. They, they, they can't interact together. There's something of, of a conflict between them that, that stops it from happening. OK, so as I said, there are other bits you could pick out from that section, but you want to be able to talk about that in terms of you could talk about it in terms of abuse, in terms of kind of, you know, the children, the boys even are not central here. They're essentially being abused for what they can gain the school. Um, you're also thinking here um, about the ways in which um, the education system as a whole is dangerous because it is it is commodifying the education system. It's not valuing students as much as it should do. It's valuing the results and it's there's a kind of corruption within it as well. In terms of the overall exchange, Think about Mrs. Lintot here. She is our only speaking female figure, and yet we've got her kind of interrupted and sidelined as well. OK. OK, um, we then have about a page later after uh, kind of Mrs. Lintot and Hector have their discourse. We have uh, the headmaster and Irwin. Um, and again, you, you want to kind of be picking this out. You're thinking about overall characterization, the headmaster, where he comes in, where he's on stage, okay, at the moment. So again, pause me again for a minute. 
have a look through it in a minute. Um, what you're looking at is this overall interaction between the headmaster and with Erwin. Again, there's a lot of the same patterns as before. So you'll see things like those incomplete sentences, try and find them. Um, you know, they're one of those things that create an overall irony. Um, you're looking for the, the similar device. We get kind of rhetorical question this time. There are different metaphors, but there's not really anything massively new. But you, you want to be ready to kind of talk around these. OK, so pause me again for a minute. You want looking to read on page 10 um, from kind of Erwin is a young man, about 25 or so. Um, and looking to read until um, the exit of them on a couple of pages ahead. So onto the top of page 12. OK. OK, so hopefully you've had a, a proper look through it um, and you've kind of picked out various bits overall. Again, I'm just going to go through, pick out some bits. I'm not going to pick out every word, otherwise you can be listening to me for hours and hours and hours and hours. OK, um, the first thing to kind of consider, again, the stage directions and scripts as kind of, it's again, he's, he's almost kind of serving as a narrative voice here looking back at it retrospectively um but you've got the stage direction um he beckons erwin cagely into the study and then scripps calls this kind of meeting clandestine um and this is important because it think about the suggestions here it suggests that the headmaster knows that by bringing in erwin he's essentially gaming the system he's he's doing something immoral he's not supposed to be doing this um, and you get the kind of continuation, obviously, of his incomplete um, sentences and not all incomplete, but a lot of incomplete sentences. Um, and the fact that he reveals he went to Hull. Um, now, Hull obviously has moved up the league tables, but, you know, it, it is a university that has historically been looked down upon. Um, Hull as a simply as a city has been seen as kind of a you know working class city it's been kind of looked down upon um and it's its claim to fame is larkin so the poet larkin um which kind of trumps everything else here essentially um and the headmaster kind of points out that there's a, a kind of corruption there even in these kind of figures that we look up to there's a corruption um women in droves art they get away with murder so the artist temperament is kind of allowing him to essentially escape um so the very fact that he went to hull kind of undermines this whole intention you know this is a decision by bennett he's done this on purpose um there are various other bits that you might kind of pick out in relation to kind of undermining the headmaster. He sort of he gives this long list of schools, which ends with kind of Leighton Park. And he kind of then rhetorically questions, is that an open prison? Um, so it kind of undermines his level of knowledge, his authority. Um, it presents him as a fool, essentially. Um, and you get other bits that kind of fit into this. So Rudge is mentioned for the first time and he's described as an oddity. He's being essentially what we would refer to now as kind of labelled. He's being looked down upon without ever having done anything. So in terms of us kind of looking at this and understanding it, well, and making arguments even, one of the dangers here is that students are marginalized they are looked down upon they are labeled and this affects them within the education system if you label a student they get treated in different ways um, and it, it's not necessarily kind of complementary um, so yeah one oddity rudge determined cry try for oxford and christchurch of all places um, Various other bits here is kind of his imperatives as he gets further through to Erwin. Get me scholarships, Erwin. Pull us up the league table and it's yours. Again, it shows us that 
before anything else and in terms of his intentions it's don't get these kids what they deserve get them you know the, the best education they can it, it's all about those league tables it's all about those kind of um school's reputation and again outer appearances become very important um erwin is a young man and the headmaster tells him grow a mustache I'm thinking classroom control and he's kind sort of assuming that all of classroom control comes down to outward appearance so this kind of imperative again at the end of this section shows that he's kind of focused on the outer appearance that everything with the headmaster comes down to outer appearances over realities um, he's he doesn't care to scratch the surface essentially there are a couple of other bits you might pick out here um you get some kind of characterization around Irwin and around hector um where um the headmaster says there is a vacancy in history and you get Irwin with the stage direction thoughtfully that is very true Irwin's not thinking about the statement in the same way as the headmaster um, there's a vacancy, so there's something left out of history, there's something empty in history, and he's seeing it in that way, whereas the headmaster means there's a literal vacancy. Um, and you also get Hector, who um, he's described as it's not curriculum directed, not curriculum directed at all. Now, in many ways, that's sympathetic for Hector because the curriculum is presented as something narrow and damaging, but at the same time you and we'll get back to talking about Hector but um, the depiction of Hector is also going to be important here in the if he's not teaching to the curriculum that is potentially damaging for the students they need the curriculum to be delivered to them right okay so there are various bits you can pick out from that have a proper look through see if you can pick out the various different kind of bits here um, the next exchange we want to look at is where the headmaster essentially interrupts the brothel scene. So where um, the Hector is allowing the students to act out the, the brothel scene and the headmaster comes in. And you probably won't need to spend as much time looking at this, but you do want to think about the kind of, again, how the headmaster is kind of under, undermined by this and the, the wider kind of context of the scene. So what has he interrupted what has been going on in Hector's classroom what's the situation that he's walked into so don't just see it from the point he enters here try and pick out things like well his use of taboo language where the pauses come in what the pauses imply about the headmaster and again how that creates a sense of irony around him okay okay so the first thing to kind of consider within the the scene essentially is that um, he has kind of come in and interrupted what is quite a dubious situation I mean Dakin has got his trousers off Hector has been allowed them allowing the boys to interact or to engage in a kind of more sexually explicit scene and yes these lads are kind of 18 years old but there is a kind of moral ambiguity to this so on one level the the introduction of the headmaster stops what could be a kind of worrying situation having said that Bennett doesn't present the boys as being in any distress at this and he actually presents the boys kind of playing along with Hector and defending Hector. They hide what he's been doing, which is worth kind of considering when you consider the kind of characterization of Hector. Uh, the main bits you want to be able to pick out from this, though, are examples of um, the headmaster's kind of broken French that in comparison to the boys and Hector and Erwin, once again it's another way of undermining his intellect that um, he very often switches between French and English um, he has kind of long pauses as he's having to kind of think of what he's going to say 
and I'm not good at French by any stretch of the imagination, but his French is not articulate French. It's not quite um, correct within it. Okay. So again, it comes down to that kind of creation of irony. You also get for the first time the headmaster um, kind of swearing essentially. He's had enough um, and, you know, simply stopping the foolishness. Um, where's it gone? Um, dun, 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 dun. I might pause it for a second. Yeah, sorry. The, I mean, the last thing the headmaster says before the bell goes and he kind of disappears again is is simply the f word so he's again it, it's all about undermining how articulate he is as a figure about kind of challenging his legitimacy and the legitimacy of his ideas okay um because bennett doesn't like them he doesn't like the fact that everything has been commodified it sort of suggests that you know, it's it's a foolish notion, essentially. Um, but I mean, again, there are other bits that you can bring in at this point. You can talk around um, the headmaster potentially kind of stepping into the middle of an abuse angle. You can debate around, well, the boy's defense. So when you're debating how abusive the, the presentation is, well, the boy's defending Hector suggests that it's not abuse um within it and things like this okay right anyway so the next bit with um the, the headmaster is the very short bit um it's quite a bit further through unless i've missed any out um so you're kind of skipping ahead now to page 49 and it's essentially the headmaster's kind of uh progress track check on erwin just to make sure he's getting things done um and again just have a quick read through so from how are our young men doing um to mrs lintot has appeared and the headmaster goes um and just think about how what again that exchange allows you to do in terms of kind of discussing the the dangers of the school system the abuse essentially of the students um, and this time, you know, consider where Bennett's placing various prosodic stresses, so where which words he's having the headmaster kind of place emphasis on. Again, we're seeing more and more of the taboo um, from the headmaster um, and things like the kind of contrasts coming into it. OK, so have a look at it yourselves and then we'll have a quick look after. OK, so as you're looking at that bit then, um hopefully you're able to kind of pick out things like well the headmaster doesn't like inconsistency we get the metaphor of the kind of the lottery essentially um that you know the uncertainty is what he dislikes more than anything else you get the taboo again and this is you know the pressure placed on Irwin can be viewed as another kind of danger in education you don't just want to look at danger in relation to the students but in relation to the teachers as well um so i don't want you to fuck it up it's you know that undermining of confidence that kind of pressure pressure placed on a teacher is kind of potentially worrying and damaging as part of it um, you get various other bits that you might pick out from this. Again, that contrast between the headmaster's views and Hector's views. So Hector's views are kind of linked to a kind of religious language very often. Um, you get the kind of faith. It's a redemptive power of words. And the headmaster's view, simply something snappier. So the contrast between the, the kind of older and the newer educational styles and the different views of education that the headmaster, again, viewing it in a kind of more um, kind of commercial sense, whereas Hector views it in a more kind of spiritual sense. Education is for the spirit, not simply for um, the kind of, you know, singular exam. OK. Um, so you know 
various different angles you can bring out here. Again, it's a continuation of the kind of abuse of the boys simply for um, a kind of commercial function and the the kind of dangers in relation to teachers as well as um, students. Right, uh, and then you're kind of skipping uh, a couple of pages ahead to page 51. Um, on to page 52 and you've got the confrontation with Hector okay so Hector has obviously been kind of abusing the boys just be careful not to think of it as paedophilia it's definitely kind of sexual abuse it's unwanted sexual attentions but um, the boys are 18 um so as you're dealing with Hector you don't want to be sympathetic to Hector and, and by any stretch of the imagination but Bennett isn't completely demonizing him we'll come to Hector in kind of subsequent lessons anyway um but here you want to think about well what's the headmaster's primary concern in relation to Hector's deviance is it that he's potentially distressed a student is it that he's you know cause damage in some sense or is the concern really more that he's potentially bringing the school into disrepute okay now you want to think well how does he then kind of hedge around at least initially saying directly what Hector's done so you get the kind of the illusions the indirect challenges to Hector is sort of more euphemistic um then he kind of moves into a slightly more aggressive tone. When Hector comes into it, think about Hector's kind of intertextual illusions and the headmasters as well. One of the things that you can pick out from this section with the headmaster is also a kind of uh, an aspect of homophobia coming into it. Um, that he's, um, it, it's not just about Hector as touching the boys, but the fact that it's also, um homo homoerotic as well in terms of the way it's kind of presented um that's as much as anything what's distressing the headmaster so he moves into something more from the euphemisms at the start into something more dysphemistic something more kind of directly challenging so again have a read through so that you're able to kind of annotate around it in a second da, da, da. Okay, so we're looking at the kind of headmaster's treatment of this. Now, the first thing to kind of note is, is you, you, the, you teach behind locked doors bit. Now, this is important. Hector does teach behind locked doors. Again, you can link this in with the kind of the danger of education as, aspect that if a teacher teaches behind locked doors and a solid door, you can't tell what the teacher's doing either in terms of delivering material, in terms of doing things to students, um, following the curriculum. So, and just simply the quality of their teaching, it's, they're not being watched, they're not being kind of assessed themselves. So, there is a genuine concern there, and we've seen that he, Hector does use that kind of situation to gratify himself. Um, but having said that, he's again, we, he comes back to the idea that the boys defend Hector, that there is kind of an understanding there. Um, but it starts off with that challenge and initially he's quite kind of euphemistic as he moves through this narrative. Um, the kind of boy on pillion, a man fiddling, where initially he kind of underplays the abuse. Um, and there's a kind of incongruity here. There's something that doesn't quite fit. He's Presenting this as actually kind of an advantageous situation for himself, the headmaster. Um, fortunately, it is not long before you are due to retire. So he's going to offer um, Hector the opportunity to retire rather than make this public. Now, that's 
to defend the kind of the reputation of the school um, rather than have it become public so this can be viewed as another kind of danger within the education system again that worry about the institution's reputation rather than the student's well-being and putting a stop to the problem okay so the simple incongruity of fortunately the initial euphemism um, as part of it um, as he goes through Hector brings in these kind of intertextual allusions we get the different bits of kind of poetry coming into it now Hector at this point is presented as kind of under pressure he's he is being challenged on his behavior he's going to be upset so we do actually get Bennett showing the audience Hector practicing what he preaches essentially um, he is um, kind of using the poetry as a form of kind of self-protection so it's not again as straightforward as his methods of teaching have no use he is using it himself um, the other bit to come out of it you get this kind of questioning I'm assuming your wife doesn't know I have no idea what women know or don't know now again we're starting to think about the kind of sexuality angle that comes into this as well Hector is clearly uh, a gay man he's fitting in with that context he's lived through a time period at which it's been illegal um, and he's he's married to fit into society but at the same time Bennett is through his language choices here suggesting a distance between Hector and his wife that there is no real genuine kind of um, love of each other um, and we get a degree of sympathy for Hector through this um, he's been kind of repressed um, as we go further through you want to think well how does the headmaster kind of again there's a selfish aspect to this he uses what is a kind of damaging opportunity and he presents it as something that um, is going to assist in his kind of um, concerns yeah so what we get is sort of strange how even the most tragic events uh, tragic turns of events generally resolve themselves into question about the timetable so he's taking a kind of human tragedy he's presenting them as kind of again simply feeding into the timetable what he wants to kind of happen um, um, and as we kind of go towards the end um, he gradually becomes more enraged essentially and we move from that kind of euphemism into dysphemism hand on a boy's genitals at 50 miles an hour and you call that nothing um, and Hector here again it, this is where it becomes ever more kind of dubious than ever before the transmission of knowledge is in itself an erotic act in the Renaissance and the headmaster's interruption there a it shows prejudice but it it does cut off Hector I mean Hector whilst at certain points he's sympathetic this is not one of his most sympathetic points I would argue um, that kind of collocation of education with eroticism is somewhat disturbing um, as part of it and the headmaster here he kind of references a number of figures from history that have been associated with homosexuality so Plato Michelangelo Oscar Wilde and he does it in a disparaging way his kind of his metaphors here that they're shrunken violets the reference to kind of you people suggests a kind of um, a, a homophobia a kind of prejudice the you people is the kind of gay community um, so we kind of want to challenge around that in terms of that gender and sexuality question that kind of dismissive nature of kind of gay culture within education um, is is important here and that 
whilst these authors are sometimes studied, they are generally not given the context of um, their kind of sexual orientation that's written out of the study of them. OK. Um, and simply the reference to this is a school and it, it isn't normal. Well, on the one hand, you know, obviously touching a student isn't normal, but at the same kind of thing, he's given the statement that's come before. He's also making a kind of prejudiced comment about um, Hector's sexuality as well. Um, so again, it depends which question you're doing as to how you can kind of work this in. Right, a couple more instances of the headmaster coming into it. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop giving you kind of bits of terminology you might work in alongside. It tends to be the same things that are kind of going over again. Um, you're kind of skipping ahead a little bit now um, and you're going to um, page 67 onto page 68. Um, and you're thinking about kind of Lintart, um, again, talking about Hector, what Hector's done wrong. Um, and again, think what goes against our kind of modern expectations. So I want you to read from, did he say why he was going um, onto um, the kind of following page? Um, he goes. Um, as part of it, okay? And make any notes you want and then we'll go through some key points afterwards. Okay, so I should just kind of um, point out a couple of bits here. Um, he again presents Hector and his deviance. It, his main concern within this is not, not the abuse of the boys, um, in, in quite the same way as we might expect as a modern audience. Um, he sort of says, shall I tell you what is wrong with Hector as a teacher? And it isn't his, his sexual abuse. It's the, the fact that his results are unpredictable, unquantifiable. And that's important because it shows, again, that his primary concern is the predictability of results wanting to have the answers um, as he goes a bit further on in the current educational climate that is no use now this isn't directly about the headmaster but think about that kind of metaphor of the current educational climate because that's important um, Bennett there is kind of linking into you know, an image of weather and weather is something that's constantly changing. Um, so it suggests the whole education system, there's an inconsistency. It is always changing and um, just in the same way. Um, as he kind of goes through the other bit that I, I think we should definitely point out. Um, dun, dun, dun. Yeah. As we go down towards the end, just before the headmaster goes out, um, to be fair, I think it was think more appreciative than investigatory, but it is inexcusable nevertheless. Think of the gulf of years and the speed. One knows that road well. So, again, his concern here isn't for what's happening itself. It's for the age difference. It's for the speed. It's Again, there's something incongruous with our expectations of what the problem is here. It's kind of being written off, essentially. OK, um, dun, 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 dun. let's go slightly further through. Yeah, um, we get a couple more instances of the headmaster coming in. Um, the next one is kind of, again, it's a challenge to Irwin. Um, again, it's sort of a similar kind of point that he's making. We can argue a degree of sympathy coming into this, or at least a degree of understanding for the headmaster. But um, again, even then, it's dubious. We, we kind of question, should he actually be defending Irwin? Now, think about the overall context for this. Um, Posner's parents have written to the school because they found Irwin's teaching of the Holocaust to be inappropriate. And 
the headmaster is basically saying what you did was wrong. Um, and it's, yeah, should Erwin have taught the Holocaust in the way he taught it? You know, should the headmaster actually defend his teaching? Was there academic merit in it? Um, we kind of want to question around that, okay? So have a look at the exchange, see what bits you would kind of pick out. But the main things you're looking at again is that concern for the school's reputation, the, the way that education can potentially diminish um, the ways in which, um, or diminish historical events even, it can take away the emotional element that it can treat them in a purely academic way. Okay, have a quick look through it. You're looking this time on page 77 um, onto the top of page 79, um, looking at the, the kind of exchange between the pair of them. Okay, so um, with this one, <clears throat> again, I'm trying to cut it down so we you don't have to listen to me for kind of hours and hours on end because I'm looking at how the time's kind of ticking on on the recording. Um, you've got several different things that you might kind of discuss here. Um, you get um, the different kind of ethnic groups coming in. So you, you reference Jewish boys are often, often are a role nowadays that is more being taken uh, by the Asian boys. So something you could discuss in here is kind of discrimination in the education system in relation to kind of education, uh, dangers in education even. Um, the way that, and as I say, we'll come back to this when we talk about Hector versus Irwin in a kind of subsequent lesson, but um, the way he challenges Irwin on his teaching of the Holocaust. Now, on one level, the way that Irwin has taught it has been very detached. It has kind of hurt Posner and hurt Hector to a degree. Um, and it has taken away the emotional impact of the event. At the same time, um, there is the kind of problem with it in relation to, well, can you do this? Is there a case to, in the education system, um, deal with historical events from a more detached perspective. Did Irwin have a valid point within this as well? Um, so where the headmaster saying that it's prefaced presumably with all the right disclaimers, it suggests that there is a fixed way of teaching something, that there is only one way to deliver it, which Irwin didn't conform to. So there's you know, that does suggest something restrictive about the education system, um, but also it's a restriction that kind of defends a group's rights. So there's a legitimacy to this. Um, and you then kind of question Irwin's behaviour, but it also, in the fixed nature of it, it, it does suggest something potentially damaging. So think about how that's kind of presented to us there. And again, it's simply the concern that he presents in another context of the reputation of the school over anything else, over the kind of support of his teaching staff, over the delivery in the curriculum. Um, Mr. Irwin, fuck the historian. I have two angry Jewish parents threatening to complain to the school governors. His concern is his reputation with the governors. Um, rather than any kind of legitimate historical viewpoint. Um, and finally, if we just consider very quickly uh, the final scene um, and kind of Hector being sent off with Erwin. Um, so we have, uh, you're looking around about uh, page 104 for headmaster comes in down towards the bottom and it kind of takes us onto page 106 so you get just before Hector's death and then you get uh, the kind of the final eulogy okay um, so it's the headmaster kind of sending off Hector and Irwin 
um, and then his eulogising of him and again the irony that comes through it so have a look at it think about how, why it might be significant that it's the headmaster that sends them off um, and um, how his eulogy the language in his eulogy creates this kind of irony again it should only take you a couple of minutes just have a quick look through it see what you would pick out before okay so looking at these kind of final bits um it's essentially a headmaster take Irwin. um and if you think about the headmaster overall he's essentially then given responsibility for forcing these two educational ideas together and for the destructive nature of that he's the one who's put them together and they then have the accident where one is destroyed and the other is kind of maimed permanently so it makes a kind of important point around um the, the kind of educational system the damage it can cause the um kind of potential dangers of putting these two together as part of it through his final eulogy once again we have the headmaster um yes it's a kind of nice eulogy for hector there's an irony in that you know the headmaster has been presented as not really liking hector um but it's also the way that he's using this kind of extended metaphor um of the kind of the bank essentially he opened a deposit account in the bank of literature and made you all shareholders in that wonderful world of words so he's once again presenting education in terms of kind of monetary gain in terms of um something commercial rather than simply education for the sake of education so there's a lot we can kind of pick out in relation to the headmaster here, okay? Right, to move on, we've only got a couple of slides left. These should take a little bit less time to kind of go through. It's and this is more about getting you to think about what you need to go away and do to kind of take it further as well. Okay, so I'm aware that my little screen seems to cut off part of this, but you need alongside these points to be kind of picking out um, kind of other criticism and things like this so i have put on here um hang on right okay sorry um yeah so you need to find kind of other criticism you need to find what other people have written around it and you need to work that in as well so i did a kind of generic google for the history boys headmaster um and i was kind of looking through search results this one that you've got a kind of link to here is kind of a useful article around um uh, the history boys and education as a whole and you want to potentially think which bits of that you can kind of um work in to your own kind of response that will kind of help you okay okay you can all have a laugh um I, I just spent about five minutes talking to the computer without actually having press record um never mind um so i want you to go away have a look at this article two things to kind of draw away you need to find bits within these articles that you can use to kind of support your view to push it forward um and two things you can do so a take the article you found um, and you can pick bits out. I would probably pick out something like this bit down here from the article. Um, I know my highlighting isn't wonderful with it. Um, the mouse is kind of up and down. Um, using that, so if I'm making the argument that it's, you know, one of the dangers of education is the way in which 
everything has been kind of commercialized, I can use that, I can work it into my response, I can use it to give another critical view that is supporting my own to show that this is something that other commentators have done as well. I can also use any articles I find and look for other references within them. So up here, we've got a kind of reference to a Jacobi and I can then go and use that to kind of potentially search out other articles. So I managed to find only the first page of this one without having to pay masses for it. But again, it's given me another kind of article. So if you search, I went down to the reference list, I searched for this one. The Sad Reception of Classical Education in Alan Bennett's The History Boys. Yes, it only gave me the first page, but there's still bits I can pick out from that um, that I might potentially um, work into it. So the first issue championed by the headmaster and serving to establish the environment of the school can be called the commodification of education. And it concerns finding then employing measures for quantifying both teaching and learning. So I can then use him as another reference within uh, a response. And you should be going out and finding these other bits of writing around the central text that you can work into your arguments, into your assessments, just like you should be doing with the Shakespeare, just like you'll have to do with Gatsby, okay? You will need this criticism that goes around it. So, um, just to summarize, and then I'll just give you a bit of work to be going on. You need to consider what argument you're making. So various bits that we've kind of picked up on, um, and it would depend on the question that you're doing, but obviously the main bit with the headmaster is that he is concerned with the reputation and the kind of commodification of education, and this is dangerous. You can also adapt that to potentially the abuse question and that that leads to a kind of an abuse of students. But you want to set out that as a line of argument before you jump into any evidence that's got to come first. You would then think, how are you gonna support this with various bits of evidence? Well, we've covered various different bits of the headmaster coming in. You would need to work in various bits of evidence, try to give yourself different angles on it to kind of extend the discussion. You would need to consider how the context comes into it. So Margaret Thatcher's changes, Bennett criticizing those, the ways in which those different kind of wider reading bits can come into this for your AO5. And you can consider your comparison. So you know that as we've been looking at the history boys, we've focused on the headmaster figure. Well, in the prime Miss Jean Brodie, we've got the headmistress. Does she show similar traits? Does she kind of present similar ideas? This is something that you will need to be thinking around as you kind of go into the prime Miss Jean Brodie, because you will need to be thinking about how you're going to bring these ideas together um to kind of form your response okay so i say my group you've already kind of hopefully started to do this i'll make an apology um and i can't change it now there are a couple of pages missing on the alan bennett article on the isi where bennett's writing around the history boys but there are various useful bits in that that i think you want to be able to pick out um i also want you you should be going away wherever they talk about the headmaster when he's not there as well, because those views of other characters also serve to undermine the headmaster. So where does Miss Lintot talk about him? Where do the boys talk about him? One of the main things you should be picking up about the boys, do they refer to him as the headmaster? Well, they don't. They refer to him as Felix. They use his first name and this kind of undermines him in that school context. So a couple of bits that you should be doing. Go away, look over the play. Where do we get those references to the headmaster by other people when he's not there? Because we've only looked at him when he's there. I also want you to read the Bennett article on the eyesight. I am aware that for some reason I've accidentally photocopied the last page in the middle of it and there's two pages missing. But you should still be able to draw out a number of useful points in terms of kind of context and criticism from it. OK, um, so just as a quick example, um, this is from um, Bennett in the article, him writing about it. You pick out the fact that he 
himself has kind of gone through this process that um, the snobbery comes into it um, that he's kind of depicting that within the headmaster so this could either pick you out for kind of context or it could pick out uh, around um, uh, different views different perspectives okay uh, potentially under AO5 depending on how it's kind of worked in there okay right last bit before I kind of cut it and hopefully upload it correctly um, you need to be thinking here um, key characterization in the play you need to keep in mind the different questions so you're kind of prepping towards them and how those different ideas kind of work together, how you're going to work in different bits of evidence to form your kind of point of view um, with the different assessment objectives hit. I know this isn't an ideal situation. I know it's weird. Um, I'm finding it very odd to kind of be sitting here talking to myself, essentially, um, but hopefully you've picked up some useful bits from kind of listening um, and some sort of sensible bits to focus in on okay bye bye for now people